Hello, it's Jamie Crick here. Welcome to our Classic FM roof terrace. We've uh, had nice, comfortable chairs today to interview Fra Fee, who uh, was in Les Miserables, the film. Um, and you, uh, you must hate people when they do this, but I've got to ask you, first of all, the name. It's know, interesting, isn't it's it? It's very odd, isn't yeah. it? I sort of decided that, you know, Fra Fee would be a way of people remembering me, at least when I go into audition rooms. But, um, yeah, it's short for Francis. Ah, I see, right. Yeah. So, short for Francis. And Fee is my actual surname, it's so that's good. So, it's not all lies, really. And, and you're from Northern Ireland, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, whereabouts in...? Uh, County Tyrone, right. which is like Mid Ulster, right in the middle. And uh, now, you've been in this movie, you're 25, you, this is a, a, it's a Hollywood big blockbuster movie. How does that feel? It's so bizarre. It really, really is. I, I think when we were shooting it, we weren't really aware of how huge it would be. Or, or in fact, maybe we knew it was going to be massive, but it felt like such a, a sort of small, self-contained thing. It's, it's essentially a very small British movie, I think, you know? Yeah. Um, the only real epic scenes are sort of when big battle stuff happens. But um, it's weird to think that it's now out and, you know, it's gone global and it's Because you finished the, um, it finished last May, but yeah. I think what people don't realise sometimes the movie finishes and then there's months of what they call post-production yeah. where they're sort of putting it together and making sure it all works and then it, then it goes out. Yeah, I think the post-production actually was for a, a movie is relatively quick this time, yeah. It was only about six months. I think they really wanted to get it out um, sort of for Christmas and for the award seasons and, th and things. Um, but I think the reason why it was able to be done so quickly is because the way sort of Tom and Danny Cohen, who's the cinematographer, there wasn't a lot of CGI required. It was done very naturally. You know, the shots were done um, raw and, and in natural environments and things like that. I want to ask you about that, but uh, let's just quickly talk about Les Miserables, uh, yes. because it is, one, it is possibly the world's most successful musical. Yeah, um, without it had this incredibly strange opening when, when it was, I think it was five hours long or something, when it was first produced, and everyone that said... That BS Sir Trevor Nunn's work there. Uh, well, and, and everyone <laughs> said that eh, nobody will go and see this, and Cameron McIntosh took it and made it into the West End show, yeah. uh, we know, which, which is... Is for me interesting because it is a bit like an opera. You know, mm -hmm. there isn't lots of stopping and talking. Everything is sung in restative and, yeah. and yeah. sung, uh, you know, a, a, as as the great uh, what will become arias. And and it, it strikes me that uh, it's it's on that, if you like, crossover between opera yeah. and between a West End show. Alfie Bove was was in the show, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I think essentially the musical has got an operatic sort of um, scope in terms of you know story and and this relentless emotional side to it, you know, that only um, sort of music can express. I think it's like Victor Hugo has this amazing quote, um, so music expresses that which cannot be said, but what has to be said or something like that. Um, and um, that, that, that's what the, the musical sort of is. Um, it, it is huge and it's epic. It's, it's got a lot of the things that sort of opera can you know, relate to. Um, so I think it'll be one of those musicals that, like as you said, 50 years down the line might be done by operatic oh, I could just like see that. someone like English National Opera taking it and doing it as a, a major yeah. opera in, a, in that sort of way because yeah. it has that spectacle and, and it has that drama. And one of the things I often think is they had the struggle of taking what is a revolution in Paris and putting it onto a stage. Yeah. So to create that spectacle was quite hard, but they do in Les Miserables. I know, it's, it's extraordinary when you think about it. So, so my question would be, you talked about the cinematography, they took all of that away in the film. And, and a lot of the film was shot very close to the face, it was all about emotion. Yeah. I, for, you know, for me, I was surprised not to have the spectacle, when of course that's much easier to do in a movie than on the stage. Yeah, I mean, I, this is all going to be about emotion, that's why, Tom insisted on having live singing and things like that. The emotion of the story had to be sort of done properly. And I think he didn't get carried away with ridiculously huge sort of um, spectacular battle scenes. I mean, they're there, certainly, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't become an action movie for the sake of it. It's very much got a, the story at the heart of it and the, the characters at the heart of it. Um, and that's why, that's why people are loving it, I think. And I think, the, again, when it comes into those very emotional songs yeah. the, for the likes of Anne Hathaway or Eddie mm. Redmayne, seeing them very, very close up, and, and if you haven't seen it, uh, then I should explain, but the lens they're using almost blurs everything out behind them. So you're really, really seeing yeah. the actor's face close up on a big screen, and there's a tremendous amount of emotion in that. I know. I mean, for all of our auditions with Tom, he would literally sit probably closer than I am to you and would just he'd have a camera on our face, absolutely nothing else. And it, cause he just wanted to make sure that 
his actors and you know singers had that ability to, to, to almost bring it to absolute nothing and yet express so much within that um, and that's you know that's so, it's so so powerful as a result whenever you're performing Les Mis on stage um, it, it is more like an opera and everything has to be sort of projected um, in the same way that you would project your voice on stage you need to project your emotions to the back of the theater in the in the film it gives you this freedom to do nothing and just you know that for me is one of the things I find most interesting because uh, yeah, that very that close up to these songs, which I find very emotional when I yeah. go and see the show, you actually do get that feeling of emotion from the actors, which you, you couldn't possibly see from the, the back row of the stalls yeah. with, on the West End. So it's interesting. Yeah, I think um, why people love the show so much and why they have been loving the show is because, uh, you know, it's, they always cast, Cameron always casts actors that have incredible voices. And let me go back to this um, thing about the, it being operatic and that's why Alfie Bow did an amazing job he did the O2 in six months in town because even if you're at the back of the stalls and you can't quite see your face you're here in this yeah. you know incredibly emotional emotionally sung huge piece of music you you have been in the West End show yeah, yeah. so, so is, are you playing the same role in the film no I am right. um, it was nice actually I got to change it up a bit I played uh, Jean Prevert and then covered the parts of Marius and Andres, in fact. And I, I, I did the show with Alfie for, for six months, which was, was yeah. brilliant. And Marius, if you haven't seen it, is the male love interest, isn't he? Yeah. He's like, he's, he gets the girl at the end, yeah. and Andres is the student leader. So, uh -huh. so where do you sit uh, in, in it now? Um, Kofarak is sort of the right-hand man to Andres. Um, I think Victor Hugo sort of describes him as the center of the, of the ABC revolutionary um, students. And in, in the movie as well, I've got an, an extra little sideline plot, which is sort of acting as a guardian for the street urchin, oh, Gav right, Rush, yep, yep. Um, played by we Danny Huddleston, um, which gives me a nice dynamic as well. It sort of gives him another s sensitive side. Um, but, but interestingly, the part of Marius, which is done by Eddie Redmayne, we had discussed it. Um, cause he came to see me play it in the West End, and we discussed the, the character heavily. And, how on the, in the stage show it works brilliantly because it is that sort of ho hopelessly romantic um, character that you know gets the girl and all, all the rest. But in the movie, because you have the ability to add you know two second scenes and give give more subplot, Marius actually became more of a much more politically motivated character. Um, it just gives him an extra edge, um, which is which is great as well. So uh, here you are now. Um, uh, a major movie. Uh, you've, you've done the West End. You are a classically trained performer, singer. Yes. Uh, so you've gone into West End musicals. You've now done a movie. How does your career look to you? <laughs> Where do you go next? Um, I'm, I'm just loving it at the moment. I feel very, very lucky. Um, my next project, interestingly, is, is on an operatic stage, uh, but it's a Stephen Sondheim musical called Follies, right, which I'm doing at the uh, Toulon Opera House in France. Um, David Charles Abel, is, uh, who conducted lots of uh, the big concert versions of Les Mis, he's assembled this uh, British cast um, to go over there. So it'll be nice to actually take you know, another musical, uh, with, sing it with some gusto on a, on a big stage like that with a full orchestra. And, um, and now you've done the, uh, now you've done the, the movie, um, has that changed life a lot for you? Or do, do people say, oh, you're the guy from the movie? Weirdly enough, I was in New York last week. I got recognised a few times just in theatre land over there, which was the most bizarre thing in the world. Because, you know, I, as I said, I like, did this in London six months ago, and I sort of feel as if it just belongs here. And then yeah. you go over to New York and you realise that it's actually massive everywhere. Um, so that was, that was b really bizarre, but I, I seem to remember I got a free cheesecake out of it anyway. <laughs> um, and, and, and as you, as you've done this um, um, tra training as a classical singer and so on, is, is that a part of your career you said goodbye to with the, with the shows and so on? I, I, uh, yeah, I was always interested in, in classical music and opera growing up and that's where my training started. Um, but my dad was, was a, is a great actor. Um, and sort of introduced me to, into th street theatre and things like that from a very young age. So it was something that I always had an affinity to and was always in my blood. I think I always wanted to sort of merge the two and musical theatre has been a great way to do that. And you know, 
it, it, it's more of a blurry line these days with things like you know musicals like Follies and all of the other Sondheim repertoire um, that you're able to actually do both which is fantastic. It's great that you came in to talk to us. It's now beginning to rain on us, so I think we it should. Is. <laughs> I can feel it coming under us. Thank, well, you, thank so you so much, much for having me. Cheers, thank you. Absolute pleasure.